que en la plaza en estos días se les ha visto cabalgar a Camilo y a Martí. Y delante de la caravana, lentamente sin jinete, un caballo para ti. Vuelven las heridas que no sanan de los hombres y mujeres que no te dejaremos ir. Hoy el corazón nos late afuera y tu pueblo, aunque le duela, no te quiere despedir. Hombre, los agradecidos te acompañan como anhelaré tus hazañas ni la muerte cree que se apoderó de ti hombre aprendimos a saberte eterno así como lo vi Jesucristo no hay un solo altar sin una luz por ti Decirte comandante, ni barbudo ni gigante, todo lo que sé de ti. Hoy quiero gritarte, Padre mío, no te sueltes de mi mano, aún no sé andar bien sin ti. Hombre, los agradecidos te acompañan. Como anhelaremos tus hazañas Ni la muerte cree que se apoderó de ti Hombre, aprendimos a saberte eterno Así como lo vi Jesucristo no hay un solo altar sin una luz por ti Hombre, los agradecidos te acompañan Como anhelaremos tus hazañas Ni la muerte cree que se apoderó Ya no caben más corceles llegando de otro confín Una multitud desesperada de héroes de espaldas aladas Que se han dado cita aquí Y delante de la caravana lentamente sin jinete un caballo para ti Sweet tea food. Greetings all. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for those watching on Facebook, for those watching on YouTube, for those watching on Twitter. We deeply appreciate you. We are the New Mexico Venceremos Brigade Committee. We are the regional coordinating committee of the National Events of Amos Brigade. The Events of Amos Brigade is a solidarity delegation to Cuba, the oldest solidarity delegation in existence in the United States that was formed 51 years ago, is it 51 years ago, um, in order to provide material support and political support 
uh, to the Cuban Revolution um, from folks living in the United States. And so we traveled to Cuba as a group, the three folks on this call, together last summer. And since then, we've been organizing in solidarity with the Cuban Revolution here from Occupied Tiwa Territory, also known as Albuquerque. So every third Wednesday of every single month since the pandemic started, we have been doing this political education series where we cover in depth a different topic about Cuba and the Cuban Revolution. The reason why we do this is because we understand that here in the United States, um, a lot of lies are spread about Cuba, a lot of lies are spread about the Cuban Revolution, and a lot of lies are spread about the man that we are going to talk about tonight. That man is Fidel Castro, one of the leaders of the Cuban Revolution. And I just realized that I started talking without saying my name. So hello. <laughs> my name is Oya Sanu. <laughs> I am an organizer with the Vance Demos Brigade. I'm also a member of the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party. And I'm going to pass it to my comrade Sheldon to introduce himself as well. So thank you, Oni. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sheldon Tenorio. I'm from Cuba Pueblo. i uh, calling in from occupied Chico territory, or so-called Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm an organizer with Pueblo Action Alliance and a part of the New Mexico and Cinema Brigade Committee. Uh, passing it off to Roberto. You're muted, Roberto. My name is Roberto Roy I went to Cuba in 1978 for the first time to the uh, International Festival of Youth and uh, Students. And I've been in about eight or nine brigades since then to Cuba. I really like it there. And I really encourage you all to go at some point if you can. Right now we're waiting to see if we'll be sending a, a brigade to Cuba from the United States this year. It's too early to tell. Uh, we did send one like we said last year. Uh, I work with the uh, Southwest Organizing Project. I've been working there for quite a while now. And um, I hope you like this video and then we'll do the question and answer. And uh, let's go. Thanks, y'all. So as Roberto mentioned, we want to show a film that tells some truth about Fidel Castro. Like, we hear nothing but lies about Fidel Castro. We hear he was a dictator. We hear he oppressed his own people. We hear he was a monster. But the reality of the situation is that Fidel Castro was one of the incredibly principled leaders of the Cuban Revolution who made an extraordinary contribution to the struggle for liberation in Cuba and to fights for justice all around the world. Fidel Castro is a hero to the Cuban people and a hero to all oppressed peoples around the world, especially my people, African people, like Fidel Castro sent solidarity missions to uh, assist anti-colonial struggles in Africa, like for decades. So Fidel Castro is someone that we deeply respect and we are very, very excited um, to share some truth about him with y'all. So this evening we're gonna be showing an interview with Alice Walker. If you don't know who Alice Walker is, she is the author of The Color Purple. She is a revolutionary African woman. She is a womanist. Um, she is someone who traveled to Cuba many, many, many times and also got to meet Fidel Castro. And so in this interview, she talks about her own experience with the man, her own experience with the Cuban Revolution, and she provides a very, very, very different perspective than what we usually hear in the United States. So that film is about 50 minutes, the interview. It's actually really funny and like sweet and cute <laughs> at times. And so we hope that y'all enjoy it. And then we hope you stick around after it's over um, for a discussion with us about what we learned and also about Castro. So without further ado, I'm gonna start the film. So how did you become what you are? Um, I was very fortunate in having parents like mine. Um, my father was, this was almost before I knew him. By the time I really knew him, he was he had worked so hard and struggled so much that he was a different man. In his youth, he was also, you know, something of a political person, very much interested in education. My mother uh, was just a goddess, actually. Uh, she, she just was like an earth spirit. My mother could make anything grow. My mother could... Um, you know, feed us, clothe us, shelter us, just like this just incredible being. I mean, I, I have never known anyone who impressed me as much as my mother did, um, and just in a very natural way. So my foundation uh, in the home was, um, was very good because I could see that even though my father was declining in many ways, there were still glimmers of the person he had been. And my mother continued to be magnificent, you know, until she had a huge stroke uh, about 15 years ago. And um, so 
you know, I went to school. I did very well in school. I started when I was four. And I started when I was four because my mother had to work. She had about five jobs all the time. She was a dairy person. She was a farmer. She took care of all of us. She cooked. I mean, she just did all of these things. And she always managed to have magnificent gardens. So my sense of beauty was always um, encouraged just by her example. Um, so I went to school at four because she had to work all the time. And so she um, asked the first grade teacher in the little school if I could come, even though I was so young. And this teacher, who's alive today and who's a wonderful woman, said, of course, send baby Alice. And I went, and I loved it. And I, you know, she was really good to me, and she knew my family, you know, from even before I was born. So my, my association with, with learning was very positive. I remember uh, when I was four or five, mostly what I did was make ducks out of uh, bars of ivory soap. And I make coloring, uh, I did coloring and coloring books. Um, and then people would always give me books because they understood that I loved to read. And they were always amazed that I read so early. And so I was really, in a sense, pampered by the community uh, in a very gentle and sweet way. Continue. I went off to college and um, I joined the movement while I was in college uh, at Spelman in Atlanta. And then because Spelman was so, um, traditional and rest restrictive. I went on to Sarah Lawrence, where I could have more freedom. And throughout, I was uh, as active as I could be, since I was pretty much a penniless student. Uh, but I was as active as I could be in the movement. And then when I uh, graduated from Sarah Lawrence, I worked in the welfare department, hated it. I was writing um, just, uh, stories and articles at night. It was very tiring. And then a friend who had offered me a scholarship years before, which I had turned down because it had strings attached, reappeared and uh, was shocked that I was living in a building that didn't have a front door and gave me the money, the scholarship. And I went to Mississippi and I worked in movement there. Um, well, I lived there for about seven years. And I got married and I had my daughter. How old was your daughter? 26. Wow. Mm -hmm. What's she like? Uh, you know, Estella, you ask me about these people, and I keep thinking, you'd have to see them, you know. And she, she's, she likes Cuba. <laughs> I sent her there. Um, she is very outspoken, very courageous in her way. Um, lovely. Why did you send her there? Well, I wanted her to see that there is a different way that there really is a different way. I mean, it, it is so painful to realize that our children, by and large, live in this culture thinking that this is the cream of the crop in terms of how you live. And basically, this society is a society that worships money, period. And what you can buy with it is a very consumer-oriented place, you know, where you know necklaces and blue jeans and all of those things are more important uh, than thought, you know, not to mention feeling, um, and not to mention community, you know. And I kept thinking, I cannot allow this, I cannot allow my daughter to grow up thinking that this is really all you can get, I mean, out of life, that this is it. And so I sent her, and I've sent several people, I, I send young people, I send my relatives, you know, I tried to send my brother before he died because he was completely brainwashed about Cuba. He really thought each time I went that I wouldn't return because the Cubans would have locked me in a dungeon and tortured me. <laughs> and he would never, you know, I could never convince him otherwise. And he was, you know, a wonderful man, but just completely brainwashed. But he never went. He never went. His son went. His son, his daughter-in-law, I sent them came back, you know, Dad, this is what happened. Here are the photographs, you know, look, we're here. They didn't, you know, he never, ever could be changed. And then, but, you know what changed him, I remember? He had leukemia. And the whole last year of his life, he was struggling with this horrible disease. But, but you know, his, the other side of him was that he was just wonderful. I mean, he, was, he was a Buddha, you know, the other side was the Buddha nature. 
So I would go to see him, and we would sit and talk about different things. And he, the only time I think it really got to him what the embargo meant to the Cubans was that I patiently explained to him that the medication that he was receiving to arrest, you know, his leukemia could not be had in Cuba. And that the people with leukemia were suffering because they couldn't get the treatment that he was getting. And he just couldn't believe it. And I think that was just before he died, he finally got it, that you cannot um, keep medicine or food or any kind of assistance that people need from them, that this is absolutely immoral, wrong, and that there's just no question about it. Do you remember the first time you ever heard about Fidel Castro? Uh, yes, in the newspaper and on television. Uh, we were very late getting a TV. Um, but I think in around 1961, in the newspaper in 59, of course, but then later. But I wasn't um, immediately, I mean, I was, there was something really wonderful about the way they all looked, of course, you know, very, um, you know, the beards and, you know, just the passionate uh, mannerisms and, you know, the stature. Um, but because I was coming out of a place where white people were totally oppressive, I couldn't really feel them because they were white. I felt that these are white people and when they get in power, they'll be just like all the other white people who've ever gotten into power. And so I didn't really, you know, but then I started as a student, of course, to read, to read everything that came out of the, the struggle. And, um, and they just made so much sense. This man is special. Mm -hmm. He said he, he was an Israeli who refused to go into the army. Mm. He was put in prison three times. Mm. He was a filmmaker, and then he had a film. He, well, he met Annie Lennox then. They have two mm. children now and everything. But uh, so he's very, he was very, the figure of Fidel Castro. And so I said, okay. Mm. Well, and so we started a little bit, and, and he, he was a fax machine and all mm -hmm. those things. Did you think, Alice? Uh, just one thing, my sound is coming in from, from the front, my question. Um, no. But it's also okay. akin to a child's mind. And that's, he, that Fidel's, Fidel's what? mind. He, he maintains his child's mind. And that is very wonderful. Not many people can hang on to the child's curiosity. And he does. And I've seen it. I mean, I, when, when uh, he reunited with Angela, when we all went to see him, and they were embracing, and he thought nobody was looking. He was examining her dreadlocks. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, you know, that's, that's really what a child would do. But, but by the time you're a grown-up, you know, you're not supposed to, you know. You're... But of course you should. You should touch the world. You should continue to examine it. You should look at it. You should smell it. You should know what it's made of. You know, it's all wonderful. But he didn't say anything, did he? No. But you notice. Of course. Writers always notice. <laughs> right. Uh, but you were saying that uh, your second visit to Cuba oh, yes. was different? Well, you know, I, I was very disturbed about this thing about, you know, gays and what was happening. And I thought, oh, Lord, you know, the machismo is going to kill off, you know, this, this wonderful forward momentum that they have, you know, just seemingly across the board because, you know, everything seemed to be from the heart. I mean, it, it didn't seem, you know, like in Russia, things that seemed kind of, you know, dry and gray and drab and everything. But anyway, I went back and uh, I, I asked to be taken to a sanitarium and I was, you know, able to talk to some of the people who, who were there. I mean, gay people with AIDS. I mean, this is not to say that you know, everybody had AIDS, but I wanted to know how the sick people were treated because I knew that would tell me a lot about how everybody is treated. What year was that? That was uh, 93, I think. And so, you know, I was able to see that they were well cared for and talk to people who just said basically they were bored, you know, that they, that they were getting good food and good care, but, you know, they were just really bored. And so there was a new policy 
that would permit people to go out on the weekends to spend with their families. Um, and, you know, I, I felt much better because before I'd left, people were saying that, you know, gay people with AIDS were in sort of a gulag situation. And of course, that would have just been intolerable. And then I've seen now a film, not Strawberry and Chocolate, which I didn't particularly like, actually, but another film about gay people in Cuba. And there seems to be such an improvement, I mean, just so much more freedom and so much more understanding and also a real countrywide effort to understand this new, very old way of life. And, you know, I feel that that there is much more respect, you know, for gay people and that gay people themselves are just beginning to be able to blossom and to, and to really, you know, give all that they have to give to their country without feeling like there's a part of them that they have to shut up. In your conversations with Fidel, uh, did the subject of gay people ever come up? No. Okay. Uh, why do you think, Alice, that Fidel Castro the figure of Fidel Castro evokes so many, so many emotions, strong emotions, people in favor and people against. I think it's his character. I think that he himself is so incredibly, toweringly passionate uh, that he himself is just, you know, very volatile in his, in his sort of natural um, way, you know, of, of speaking, of, of convincing, you know, of cajoling of, you know, whatever. I mean, he, he is really very powerful. Uh, and I think that, that that is one very basic place where, where people feel that they have to, to meet that passion somehow. And since there are not very many people in the world who can meet that passion um, with the same kind of good-heartedness that I think he has, they bring what they do have, which is, you know, a sort of passionate disagreement, a passionate dislike, a passionate, you know, whatever. Um, and so someone like me, I mean, wh where I feel, I mean, I, I enjoy the passion. I mean, I, I, you know, I can, you know, appreciate every change of mood um, because it seems to me that that is what is wonderful about meeting with people. They're supposed to be different. You know, and they're supposed to have many ways of expressing themselves, and they're supposed to go through changes. Uh, but if you're not used to that, and if you're in a culture like this one where people just do everything they can to be, you know, talking heads, you know, they think that to be a talking head is the highest mark of civilization. You know, you're just supposed to be there with nothing else moving but, you know, kind of here. You know, no light in your eyes. You know, your heart totally, you know, just chilled out. Uh, so I think that's, that's part of it. And then, of course, there's what he's saying. And there's what he's doing. And there's the fact that they haven't been able to kill him. I mean, that must really be upsetting, that they have not been able to kill this man who has persisted in being exactly who he is for all of these years against the mightiest power on the earth. It's quite phenomenal. It's wonderful. I mean, it's, it's something that it seems to me that people should appreciate, you know, just, just as, a, as a phenomenon, you know? I mean, he's his own kind of redwood. <laughs> when I think of Fidel, I often think of him as um, a redwood tree, you know, in, in uh, California. We're down to really fighting for the very last of the old ones, these precious old trees. And the lumber companies, you know, in which, which um, Clinton has just given freedom to, to start cutting them again. But we fight for these old trees. I mean, they are magnificent. And they do the heart good. I mean, you may not like redwood. You may prefer oak, you know, or pine. But actually, you know, they are magnificent. And, and I think that just to have them just around encourages the spirit. And Fidel is like that. Whether you like him or not, he is incredible. And he's, he's 70 years old. He's old. <laughs> he's 70 years old, yes. Well, you know, I think it would be great for him to be 100, you know, and more, just so we could see it. You know, we need to see old revolutionaries, you know. I mean, think of all of our revolutionaries. They mostly die young. 
Well, that you know, that's that's glorious too. But how wonderful to have a really old revolutionary. I mean, he could be eighty-five and he could have a beard down to his waist, you know, and hair out to here, or none, you know. And how good for us to see this that it's possible to be a revolutionary and to grow old. And some people say that he's been in power too long. The thirty-seven years is too long. Well, they do, and maybe it is. You know, I don't feel like I can say what's too long for the people of Cuba or what's too long for Fidel. Having been there, I think that if the people felt like it was too long, they would give him his gold watch. <laughs> and some people said, well, he's in power so long thanks to his adversaries. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think he's in power so long partly because people really like him. Now, and, and actually love him, really. Uh, and I sometimes think that he's too much of a father. I mean, I think it's about father now. And I think that's why people feel such loyalty and such devotion. I mean, he is just like the islands, the country's father. Uh, and there might be a real problem with that, you know. But I don't know. And I figure, you know, if there is a real problem with it, the people can take care of it. They are well-educated. They really think for themselves. You know, they, they can really talk you under the table. And, you know, and they are, they're armed. So, you know, if they are sick of father, I think father will not be there forever. He's outlived nine U.S. presidents. Exactly. And some presidents have said terrible things about him. Yes, yes, well, you know, they would. Um, Johnson said uh, he would like to take that Castro fellow, wash him, shave him, and spank him. Sounds like a sexual thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that really tells us a lot about Johnson. <laughs> he doesn't say that about Lady Bird. <laughs> and speaking about people who love him and people who don't, um, the people in Africa have a special feeling to Castro. Well, the people in Africa should, because, especially in South Africa, because I think without the Cubans' help, they would not have uh, been able to uh, overthrow apartheid. You know, I mean, Cubans not only sent word and, you know, support and, you know, but they actually died there. Um, fighting against the South African armies. So, you know, and I think Fidel at some point mentioned that, um, you know, he felt himself to be a part of Africa. I mean, he has never, it, it seems to me that he has never really traded on being white. And it's because he doesn't, you know, have that white trip that we often in the third world tend to forget it. I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't wake up thinking about Fidel as a white person, you know, ever, except when I was very young, and I thought he was just like all the rest. But um, I think when I realized that he was interested in teaching people to read and write, and he, he wanted, you know, free uh, health care and uh, education and cheap food for everyone, um, you know, he, he didn't resemble the oppressors anymore. So that was very good. Um, many important personalities in the United States have tried to meet Fidel Castro, people who have different ideologies. You see the Rockefellers going to Cuba, Ted Turner going to Cuba, Hank Aaron going to Cuba, uh, Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it, it is so? I think that, you know, many people have a great deal of affection for Fidel. And... We, you know, I think love is the most mysterious thing, anyhow. You never know really why you love people. You just do, you know, you just do. And for some people, it could be that he strikes in them um, a memory of, you know, uh, 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 the kind of world they wish they could have had when they were children. I mean, that's how I often feel, you know. What would have been, what would have, would it have been liked? Like, oh, cut that. But what would it have been like growing up? to not have to worry about health care, you know, for me and my family. Everybody was often sick, you know, or free education. Um, 
So I, I don't know about why everybody else, you know, wants to um, affirm Fidel. But for me, it's, it's because he reminds me of what could have been in my own life. And why do you think there is so much hostility to Fidel Castro here? Well, because of all those Cubans that came to Miami. I think if they weren't here in Miami, constantly bending the ear of the White House, uh, many people wouldn't think about Cuba. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, is that this is a capitalist country, and Cuba is a socialist one, and it's very near. And if, if people could just see it, you know, see what the Cubans are doing as socialists, um, I think the critique of capitalism here would be much stronger and much clearer. Have you been criticized because of your attitude or your activities in relation to Cuba? Yes. My favorite criticism was from an Australian um, news person. He was interviewing me. I thought he wanted to talk about my books. But instead, he just started, you know, raving about why are you supporting this dictator, you know? And um, don't you know that this man is blah, blah, blah? You know, he had a whole list of things. But I was struck by his choice of the word dictator because um, I couldn't believe he thought he lived in anything other than a dictatorship uh, because it is so ridiculous, I think, to think that there are democracies that, that we live in, you know. I mean, what we have is a corporate white male dictatorship. And they very cleverly change whatever white man is at the head every four or eight years. But they're all pretty much the same. I mean, even the ones who, you know, are really good, quote, you know, do good things, they're usually forced to do good things. You know, if they pass a bill that helps poor people, it's usually because they can't do anything else and rich people are getting upset, you know, because the poor people, they have to drive over them, you know, they're sleeping in the street, you know, or they, you know, stumble against them and they don't smell good. I mean, you know, I mean, it's so... Um, so I always think that the Cubans, even if Fidel is a dictator, have come out much better than we have because, you know, they've had only one dictator in 35 years, and we've had nine, you know? So I have been criticized so much in my life that this is just one more, you know? And it, it I... <laughs> I can't really um, care. But you feel connected to your well-known writer, but you continue doing the things that you think are, are right. Are Always. I, absolutely. That is where the joy is, as I'm sure you know. Did you... Um, I'm, I don't know why, what frame you're in now, but I'm going to start asking interesting Going in a little, also said that Fidel would be considered a traitor if he would retire in the middle of all this hostility with mm -hmm. Cuba. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, I think that's true. So those are the ideas a right. little bit, and then yeah. just an ending that I mm -hmm. have. Well, you know, and, and not only that, um, I mean, I don't see how he could have just stepped away now. You know, it wouldn't make sense. Um, oh, God, I, I lost that thought. I, Da, 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 da. Well, anyway, let's go on. Maybe we'll come back. Okay. Uh, in order to save justice, right, sometimes you have to sacrifice freedom. A more open society if the U.S. was not so hostile. Uh, and that he would be considered a traitor, right, if he, if he retired in, middle, in the middle of this situation. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I know what, what it was. I'm just, uh, well, you know, in this country, they think, you know, by now people have been programmed to think, that you actually have to have elections, you know, every however, you know, and these, this is the democratic way. But in fact, can you imagine Cuba trying to afford an election like the kind we have? You know, these things cost so much money. Where is that going to come from? I mean, I just, you know, I, I, it, there has to be, you know, if there, there's going to be an election in a poor country like Cuba, like Haiti, like, you know, Ghana, there has to be some other way of, of doing it. You know, I mean, maybe they can come up with a way 
And I don't know about the elections that they had. I think they, there was an election. The Cubans have their elections. There's a different kind of election. I would think. And they have this one party, but there are different sectors in that one party. They said they can't fragment. They can't, for the unity's sake. Right. They have to keep together. Mm -hmm. Well, in any case, it's their choice. I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand this one here, except that I now know it is completely controlled by corporations, you know, who have even called themselves trustees of it. You know, so it, in our country, it is very corrupt, the system. Of you know, elections. Of elections, right. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And there's no point in wishing that on anyone. Uh, it's been said that people, um, not individuals, make history. Do you think this applies to Cuba and Fidel Castro? People, not individuals? What does that mean? History is made by the people and not by individuals. But oh, in the I case of mean. Cuba, yeah. do, do you think mm -hmm. that Castro's role was shaped history? Oh, I do. I think so. Say the whole sentence. Well, I, I think that um, Castro's role in shaping Cuba uh, is major. It really is. There's no getting around it, I don't think. But I would say that the Cuban people, you know, and I get so annoyed that they are overlooked. I mean, people insist, it seems to me, on sticking Fidel's head on top of every Cuban body that you ever try to see, you know? So you never see the people. I mean, but, but I think that's, that's, that's um, partly the way things, um, the image is managed, you know, especially here in this country. Um, so that, you know, when I think of Cuba, I don't automatically think of Fidel. I mean, I, I do think of him because he is so large. But I also think of, of the people there, you know, the ones who are, are teachers and, you know, doctors and, you know, uh, just regular people. Do you think and they've made it. I mean, you know, they, you, know you, you do sometimes have to have leadership, you know, people who, who, who have a vision and who benefited from an education, you know, which he definitely did. Uh, but, you know, you also are important in carrying forward what is, you know, considered by consensus the best, you know, for your society. Some people have said that Fidel Castro is a lonely man. Did you get a sense of that? I did. I did. Now, but I also... I'm modest enough to understand that, that I know nothing about him, you know, his, his life, his private life. So, you know, who am I to even presume that he may be lonely? But I must say I felt, I felt that he was. Um, it's just a feeling. He keeps his private life very private. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so? Well... I've had many thoughts about that, that over the years. You know, I thought, well, you know, if you're constantly being worried that somebody's going to assassinate you, you would you would hide your children. You would hide your young, you know, like any creature in the forest, you know. And that has always made the most sense to me. I mean, for someone so large, so visible, so hated, you know, that you know, you you, you wouldn't want anybody standing next to you. Really. Do you think there's ever any possibility of Clinton and Fidel coming together and talking? Um, as an optimist, I am. I, I mean, I do. I think that um, that is, is possible. But I don't feel that it will necessarily mean very much. Because I think Clinton is um, so easily persuaded, you know, against his better judgment. I think that if they did talk, he would be, and I think he may be fearful of this, he would be in some ways captivated. Uh, because Fidel's personality is just so, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, he is an interesting person. Uh, and Clinton, I think, could benefit from, uh, you know, his knowledge, his experience. It could be a really good thing if they talked and if they developed some kind of relationship. 
I mean, even if they were not heads of their countries, it seems to me that, especially in these times, we really need all the mentoring we can get. And I think Fidel would be a very good mentor for Bill. How do you think history, 50 years from now, will remember Fidel? Positively. You know, when I was in Russia, when I was a student, I was 18, I took the train from uh, the Finland station <laughs> all the way down through you know, the Soviet Union and, and through Kiev, and I was reading History Will Absolve Me the whole time. And I was so moved because, you know, at last, here was someone actually writing about the condition of my own people. Um, and I think that that is prophet prophetic, the title of his book, History Will Absolve Me. Because look at the world. You know, where is it going? It is going in the direction of rich people being excessively greedy and rude and mean and killing off the earth, people, everything. And all of this is, is so clear. It's not as if, you know, it's at all hazy. It's very clear. And poor people, on the other hand, are more and more destitute. They're being treated much more badly, you know, than anyone 30 years ago would have expected. I didn't expect it. Our communities are being drugged into oblivion you know, by people who then take the money and, you know, just buy up whatever's left. So in the context of this kind of world, um, you know, students, you know, people of color, poor people, women, will absolutely begin, if they haven't already, to understand what he intended, even if they never understand what Cuba has accomplished. What do you think will happen after Fidel? Well, that worries me a little bit, you know, because I don't know who is um, there to, to carry on and, and what kind of power they have. And, and, you know, I can illustrate the kind of thing I, I fear by telling you that I'm very close to the Native American community in this country, many Native American communities. And I was very good friends with one leader named Bill Wapapa. And he was like Fidel, but, in, but not, you know, volatile. And, you know, he was, he was very um, powerful in a very sort of soft-spoken way, very, you know, almost Buddhist in his manner. But he could connect everyone. I mean, he, there was just something about him. You know, he was also a focal point for people, and especially for the Native American community locally. But he died. And a, a younger Native American man took his place. And he just didn't have that. He, he wasn't able to bring us together. We, we just, you know. So, you know, that I, I am concerned. I mean, I don't know if there's someone, you know, they don't have to be, you know, a carbon copy by any stretch, but they do have to have a certain ability to keep people together. I mean, to, to keep them feeling that they are a country, you know, and not an island. Could, could you just tell me in one sentence, what is Fidel Castro? A revolutionary. And, and <laughs> um, I would say now he may be upset to be called old, and I hope he won't be. But I would just say he's a beautiful old revolutionary. <laughs> what would you say? Oh, you know what? Well, everybody says something different. It was very good. Nobody said it the way you did. Mm -hmm. And then you kept it on her. Long time, so that was good. Uh, okay. um, Madame Mitterrand said she spoke about the French resistance mm -hmm. and how she heard about him the first time and whatever. And then when I asked her that, she says, "Well, it's like the French resistance. He's a man who's resisted or was opposed or something like that." In French, she said it all. Mm -hmm. uh, the dictatorship of the money. Yeah. Right. Interesting mm -hmm. way of putting right. that. Mm -hmm. Right. She was very. 
Um, Pierre Cardin. So he should dress Pierre him. Pierre Cardin, he's like this. And, oh, he's a beautiful man. He's big, big like the gold. <laughs> big, big like the gold. But he's, but he's a dictator. No. Oh. He said it, but then he started saying how much he cared. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's gonna open, he wants to open up Maxim's, his restaurant. In but, Cuba, right? Yeah. In Havana. And it's like these people have no, but they're so... But see, that's what they mean, though, you know. What they mean by dictatorship is basically, uh, you know, that, that poor people, um, let me, let me, let me back, let me do, do this. Yeah, because I, I really want to speak to this though. Yeah. I can't get it, I'm too tired. But it's like they, what, they, what they want is a dictatorship of the rich. You know, not a dictatorship of the poor. You know what I mean? But when you have a workers party that is in power, that's what you have. I mean, you have the, the I mean, they don't, I wouldn't want to call them a dictatorship, but if the people rule, you know, instead of the rich people, then, you know, they rule. And they're the majority. You know, and Pierre Cardin, you know, is not going to have his restaurant right in the middle of Havana. No. And, you know, we interviewed Edward Heath, the ex-Prime Minister of uh, England. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were looking for, you know, critical. He wouldn't. He goes down to Cuba oh. all the time. Mm -hmm. And he's very fascinated by uh, the figure of Fidel Castro and visits mm -hmm. and defends. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just, you know. And did you not write a letter to Clinton? Somebody mm -hmm. told me that. Mm -hmm. I did. Because he spoke to us about that. He said he, we were there in London at the time mm -hmm. we were downing the planes. Oh, yeah. So he was furious mm -hmm. at the United States. Right. With the Helms Burton and all of that. Mm -hmm. No, I did. I wrote to him. What did you say? Um, well, I was just trying to make him understand that you cannot starve people, you can't starve children, you can't, you know, um, stand next shoulder to shoulder with Jesse Helms, who was one of the segregationists who tormented my grandparents, my parents, and me. You know, that I had to give years of my life and many people had to die because of laws against black people that that man put into effect. You know, so Clinton, by signing the Helms-Burton bill next shoulder to shoulder with this man, was to me just the gravest insult possible to all people of color. You know? So anyhow, he wrote back. Clinton. Uh-huh. And actually, the, what had happened was he had, he had invited me to the White House, you know, to meet. And I don't know. And I, I didn't go. And um, I wrote this letter instead, you know. Um, and he wrote back in the first line, you know, a little formal stuff. And then he just launches into all this Cold War ideology, you know, about how Cuba would be like Chile and Haiti and, you know, and, you know, I mean, it, it was just really um, uninformed. And again, I would say that, you know, he would have to see for himself and he has to stop listening to the Cubans in Miami, you know, who are not going to vote for him no matter what he does. And also, they were trying to elect Hillary's brother, you know, to some... I mean, it's all just unbelievably inhumane, you know, that you'd sell out a whole country to elect somebody's brother, you know, or to get votes for yourself. I mean, it's, it's unreal. How can you sleep at night? Do you think after the election, things might change? Well, you know, Estella, we're, we're such pitiful people, really. I mean, we, we hang on every hope. You know? I mean, why should we think that things will change just because he's reelected? I mean, is it because he will, you know, he can only go over there, for, be there for eight years? And then we think that in these four, he's going to just come back and be really great? I don't know if greatness is there. And I certainly, you know, don't think Cuba should, after all these years, put much hope in it. 
I think that their best bet is what they're doing, you know, just trying to be as independent as they can be, given what they're under. Do you think the revolution will survive? Not in the form that they would really ideally want it to, no. Yeah, I mean, I, that's totally an impossible dream, I think. You know, tourism, which I really despise, is the kiss of death, I think, to anything that is really authentic. I left San Francisco because it was like living on a postcard. They have no other choice. Oh, I know that. I know that. And that's what's sad, you know. And I just hope that somehow, because of, you know, 37 years of trying to be new people, you know, they will, will maintain some of that. They are a different people, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Yeah, but it's a tragedy you. to lose that. You know, they are themselves a different kind of, you know, redwood tree, you know? And every other country has been clear cut. And you call Fidel a redwood? He is a redwood tree. He's an old growth redwood tree. And all around him has been clear cut and he's still standing. And they're lusting to go in and make that final cut. And then we will have nobody really, you know, we'll have I mean, not like that. We'll have many other wonderful people, and we ourselves will be, you know, wh whoever and whatever we are, but um, he is an inspiration. You're glad that you met him. He's 70 years old, so... I never expected to. Uh, I always wished I could, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'm really happy to have met him. I think he's really, really a special person. And also, you know, I never feel I have to agree to every single thing that anybody does, really. I mean, I, I feel quite free to just appreciate what is wonderful and affirm that, you know. Nice pictures you have. <laughs> I love those pictures. Yeah. Well, it was a good meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, too, you know, you cannot meet Fidel without also in spirit feeling that you're meeting Che. And um, you know Camilo, and uh, uh, Cecilia, or is it Celia? Celia. Celia. Um, and um, Abel. Abel. You know Abel. Uh huh. And Maria. Uh huh. So all of that was in the moment of meeting, you know. And I brought with me Malcolm. And I brought with me Martin, and I brought with me Fanny Lou, and I brought with me Rosa Parks, you know? So that is what makes, you know, a moment really rich and real when you know that you are embracing, you know, all the dead and what they hope for. And I will never forget. Che lying dead with his hands cut off. And I think, you know, one of the places where you meet Fidel is knowing that in his loneliness, whatever it is, he has to think about that too. These are hands that he knew. interviewing Che's daughter. We traveled with her. Uh -huh. And she just was going, uh, coming from Europe with us at the same time. She was going there to say all these stories, they're trying to start all these stories that that uh, Fidel and Che didn't get along and he sent him to his death. And oh, whatever. I know that. I've heard that. So she was, she's been traveling talking about that. Well, they said everything they could possibly say. You know, but my feeling about that is that if you had sent someone deliberately to his death, you wouldn't have his face stuck up all over the place. You couldn't bear it as a human being. I mean, you would have to be so devious, so twisted, you know? Uh, so, no, I never really believed that. His children, grandchildren, Che's grandchildren call him grandpa. Mm -hmm, they should. I think. 
It's nice that he's reading your book. I love that. <laughs> well, he when I saw him the next time, and he said, yes, you know, very interesting. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, you don't remember a word of it. <laughs> Well, that was, you know, the embrace that says, you know, I come from a world where they've killed everybody that, you know, spoke up, and you come from a world where they killed everybody but you. You're live. So, cool. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, we definitely wanted to offer a space as well if anybody has questions um, after viewing the video or if anybody wants to ask us questions about anything as well. Um, we'll take a couple questions and then we'll be able to kind of wrap up um, around 7 -ish. Our programming usually goes around an hour long. Um, so yeah, just let's, try, let's see if there's any questions in the chats. Do you want to let folks know why we cut the video for it? And then maybe we can share some things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Again, um, just thinking about programming wise as well. Um, usually the last Wednesday of, of every month, we have New Mexico Events and Brigade Committee. Uh, we do hour long programming like this, where we show video, or we do presentations and we speak. We do like political popular education as well. Um, so yeah, also just want to add in to um, a note about the VB. If you want to go learn more, you can check out uh, vbforcuba.com. Um, there's also a donation link there too, that if you would like to donate and continue supporting um, Solidarity with Cuba, we're always, always in solidarity, always, always doing different work, quote unquote work. <laughs> um, just always trying to learn and then uh, get that knowledge as well and having that knowledge accessible as well. So again, like this programming right here too. Yeah. If there's anything else, um, Oni or um, Roberto, you would like to add as well? i just like to say one thing about uh, Fidel Castro. I remember in uh, 1978 in Cuba at the International Festival of Youth and Students, uh, we had gone to this stadium where there were like tens of thousands of people and Fidel Castro came around, and he was cruising around in his Jeep with his entourage, just meeting with different contingents all over the world, all the young people. And I remember when he came to our group, the United States group, and uh, one of my good friends, uh, Jean Gauna, who's one of the founders of the Southwest Organizing Podcast, uh, she went also on that trip. Uh, Fidel came along in the Jeep, got out of the Jeep, and she ran and she hugged him. And she... Had, I always talked about that, that she was able to hug Fidel Castro. And that was like five or six feet away from him, you know, so I couldn't get any closer at that point because everybody mobbed him practically. So that was uh, real exciting. Good. And we got to see Fidel every year because we always, we generally went to, uh, uh, around the May Day. And the Cubans throw this huge, this huge May Day parade. Like tens and twenties of thousands of people come up to the May Day parade. And Fidel was always there waving at everybody at the head of the parade. So we, we got to see him every year that we went out there. Thanks. I always love when Roberto shares stories about uh, previous Benson Amos Brigades and his experiences in Cuba because there are so many. But yeah, I agree. I really appreciate this interview. I really appreciate like Alice Walker's perspective. Like She's someone who I had read and like knew before I was even at all involved in Cuba solidarity work. And just like the way she talks about him and like the way she humanizes Fidel Castro, I just very, very much appreciate this interview because it shows you that he was like complex, but it shows you that he was good. He was a good man. And it's like, I feel like because Fidel Castro existed as a person, because the Cuban revolution happened, all of us that are fighting for revolution, all of us that are fighting for liberation, like have a better chance of winning because he was here because he existed. So yeah, I just really appreciate this interview for humanizing him, and I really, really love Alice Walker. But it's 7 o'clock. Um, we are at our time box for this event. We appreciate you so much uh, for joining us and for your comments. Thank you. As uh, Sheldon said, we do this on the third Wednesday of every single month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So please join us next month for another political education event 
about Cuba, and we hope you have a good 